So today I played a game in the London system that I think is pretty instructive. Actually, I was playing against the London system. And uh, it, it ties in with the, the move order studies that I've done. And uh, specifically this trick where black plays bishop to f5. And um, after I played the game, I thought I played a really good game and I analyzed it. And then I looked at it with the engine and realized that there was some subtleties that I didn't fully appreciate. So I wanted to to make a video on it, kind of cement it in my head, um, and just kind of show what I've what I've learned. Um, I played the game on chess.com, and I actually I looked the guy up, and his his uh, rating is at the ninety eight or ninety nine point five percentile. So I was uh, pretty pretty pumped to get a win against this guy. But anyway, let's look at the game here. So I play the Slav um, in general. But against this London system with bishop to f4, since I play it as white, I wanted to start playing this early c5 move. Um, and I'll go over it a little bit in a minute. But uh, I think this is the best thing to play against the London system. So I'm learning it as, as white, and it involves a little bit of memorization. And so I thought he would probably play knight to f3 and then knight b to d2, and I would move my queen out to b6 here and grab this pawn and play what's called the poison pawn um, variation of the London, but that's not actually what happened. And what happened was very instructive actually. So I wanna I wanna look through that. So he kind of uses this triangle move order. And so he does this thing where in one of my previous videos I talked about not combining knight to f3 with c3 until white has played knight b to d2 and um i'll put a link up here um that you can watch that video uh if you're interested but it, it goes over it in a lot of detail actually but the idea is is that um we get these uh well let's just look at what happened in the game and then i'll, and I'll switch to another screen and we'll kind of compare um that that position so in the game i played knight or I played queen to b6, and he played uh, queen to c2. And ideally, white would want to white would want to play queen to b3 here. Um, but with our setup as black, they can't really do that. So let's let's explore why a little bit, and then we'll look at how I reacted to what he played in the game. Was uh, queen to c2. So, if we look at the, the London move orders generally here, white would like to respond to this uh, position with queen to b3. And now, I mentioned that white combined these two moves, c3 and knight to f3 without having played knight b to d2. And the reason that's an issue is because, like I said, the ideal move for white, and you can go through it, you can go to my two knights tabia um, video where I explain it in detail, but white would like to play queen to b3 here. That's their best move strategically. The problem is, is that in this position, black can play c4. And notice that white doesn't want to do the exchange here because this is good for black. It basically improves the qualitative value of this rook because it opens it up. It basically, he developed that piece for us. And then we have this easy play where we ram these uh, B pawns up the board, you know, and use C3, you know, as a hook. And um, that's like really easy to play and pretty good. And I end up getting a position like that in, in the game that we'll go through in a minute. But... What I want to show is because that position is bad, in this position here, white, you know, you know, would would move back to C, queen to C2, would like to, but the problem is, is it runs into this bishop to F5 trick. And um, the problem is, is that white cannot take that because then we grab on B2 and we pick up this rook. So... 
let's take a mental snapshot of this position right here. And we'll compare it to what happens in my game because I think it's important to understand the distinction. And by what I played showed that I didn't really understand or I didn't notice this difference. Um, and I got kind of excited thinking, oh, this guy's combined c3 and knight to f3 and I'm just going to punish him. And um, he's rated high enough that I probably should have been a bit more um, cautious about just assuming that he'd totally screwed up. So if we flip back to the game, we'll see that in the game he played this. And if we compare it to what we just looked at, we can see that the major difference here is that the C pawn is on C4, and in the game, the C pawn is on C5. So in the game, I ended up playing bishop to f5, think, thinking, oh, this is great. Um, and it ended up great because the guy didn't um, play it ideally. But in the game, what ended up happening is he played queen to b3, I played c4, and now this is like a souped up version of what we just looked at because he's basically forced here to trade the queen. And now we have this position that we just looked at with the bonus that my bishop has already developed. So we're in this position that was good for black to begin with. And now it's even better because we're a tempo ahead and we got our bishop developed. And this is going to be, this is going to be pretty brutal and it, and it was in the game. But... The, th the key thing to notice is that this move worked um, in the game, but black actually has this move here. You know, um, d, ta uh, d takes c5, hitting the queen. And so that's an important thing to, to a big difference actually. And then all of a sudden, uh, white's actually better instead of black being much better. And so that was kind of like my key takeaway as far as move orders from this game is there's a big distinction between what I had in this game where my pawn is on c5 versus what it would be like if my pawn was on c4, like in this position where I could just play this and um, everything's great. So long story short, what I probably should have done in my actual game is instead of playing bishop to f4 like I did, um, I probably I probably should have um, decided to hunt down this bishop here. So, um, you know, ideas like knight to, uh, uh, knight to h5 and just hunt that bishop down. I could, of course, lock this up first if I wanted to. But, um, so... I guess the thing is, is white did make this concession because of our act of play is black because he had to put his queen on c2 instead of uh, b3. And he had to spend time doing that, which means that he wasn't afforded time to open up a, a, an escape hatch for his bishop. So that gives us time to, you know, start hunting down his bishop. And that probably would have been a better... Uh, path to go down than what I chose in the game uh, bishop to f5 which I thought was brilliant not brilliant but I was like excited because I'm like oh man the stuff I'm studying is paying off and it did pay off because he didn't find his way um, his way through the complications but we'll quickly go through the game because um, you know it's you get really good play um, if you end up in a position like this where you know, our rook is now opened up. We have an easy plan of shoving the B pawn up the board. And I, you know, when I'd studied some stuff on the openings, they would refer to how, how great this position is. And that's why white has to avoid it, you know, at all costs, basically. And, uh, but I haven't uh, really, I haven't really ever done it from, from black side. And I kind of avoid it as white. I get, sometimes when black plays the Slav, you get kind of like almost like a, a mirror image kind of thing, but it's a little different where you play C4 and then you start, you know, marching your pawns, uh, your, like your B pawn up the board. 
but um, that's actually a little bit different than, than what we're dealing with here. So in the game, I just start ham hammering the B pawn. And this move in hindsight was, was a waste of time according to the engine. Um, I thought it was okay at the time because I wanted to keep this bishop on the board. I wanted to keep that bishop on the uh, B1 to H7 diagonal because I wanted to control B1. And I thought that would be a nightmare for him if he could never really easily contest the B file with his rooks. So um, the computer liked uh, just E6 and just getting on with it. Um, you notice like he can't steal our bishop yet because if he were to try something like this, you know, we still have, we still have this. It's, you know, we would get his light squared bishop, but my instinct was to preserve that bishop. And I wanted to just keep stuff on the board while I had this advantage and then try to get all my pieces to coordinate together. So we won't spend a lot of time on this, but he kind of, uh, he kind of goes astray. And now in hindsight, I'll, sh I'll show you, I do play this move later, but in hindsight, D takes C would have been a really good move here. Um, one thing I've been noticing watching some videos on like chess dojo and just one thing I've noticed helping, uh, a friend of mine with chess is that at the level that I'm still at, a lot of times games are decided by time and not given enough uh, respect to time. And so Bishop to E7, um, I played because I always want to have an absolutely good reason to move a, a piece twice before I've developed all my pieces. And so I probably played that a bit too quickly and shouldn't, um, I didn't play it quick, but I, I probably should have put more thought into to C takes B, but I was hoping he would uh, take this pawn here. And then now if you look at it, like what does he really have? And so now I can go about this plan, uh, B takes C, and then point out to him how weak the C3 pawn is now. So he has to protect that. And I ended up playing Rook to A3. Um, you know, I should have spent a little more time on it. Um, the computer pointed out to me, which I thought was good, and I mean, it worked out well. The computer, though, pointed out to me that how powerful bishop to uh, a3 would be here. Because if you look at it, you get your bishop to a3. Your bishop can then go to b2, forking these two rooks. If the rook, one of the rooks tries to go, like if the a rook tries to go to b1... Then you got just you can remove this knight, you know, and unveil discoveries on that rook, and that's actually just it's just absolutely crushing. What I played was still, I believe, it was like three pawns better according to the engine, but um, so he goes down this this path here. So I just grabbed the material, and then I was kind of ready for different things. But one thing I I did not expect, he did this exchange sacrifice in the game. And I think his idea is, is he figured his only, his position is so bad here that his only counterplay is to just try to ram this A pawn down the board. And, um, you know, as you get up to these stronger players, they don't, they don't give up easily, even in a, in a really tough position like this, they're going to try to use any counterplay that they can come up with. They don't just throw in the towel easily. And so he did put up some resistance, um, and we'll kind of quickly go through it. But I, I played that. I wanted to, to lock that A pawn in place and not let it move ahead. And I kind of, I liked seeing this move because um, now I just have this uh, F, F6 move, which I had kind of looked at that idea earlier. And I couldn't quite get it to work. But the idea is, is now this knight, if we can attack this knight, he can't get, he can't get out of there with uh, E5. So it's, a, it's, a, it's kind of nice for me. And he didn't really he didn't really gain anything. He's opened up, you know, I don't know, it just it, it didn't seem great to me, but and I decided for better or for worse, I decided that I thought I would be able to like keep that pawn under control, get the rooks off, get that rook off the board, so that he can't have that pawn supported by his rook. 
Um, and then I'll be able to like gain time hunting down his bishop and it ended up working okay, although he put up he put up more resistance than I was kind of anticipated. I mean, I know he's a strong player, but I just didn't realize that there would be as much for him in this position as there was. So I got to try to get these bishops to work together. And, and when these bishops are next to each other, they like control so many squares that they're very powerful. So now my threat here is to just simply shove this thing right up the board because every square here it's uh, supported by a by a bishop the pawn is supported and uh, I found this move here I was pretty happy I found that because I, I only got a minute and a half on my clock I obviously got a, a big advantage but this guy's trying to find tricky moves you know like this bishop c5 obstructs that pawn so I can't necessarily just shove it because shove it you know to c7 because his knight and bishop cover that square but now i think it's pretty pretty tough for him so the good thing is is all my pawns but one are on dark squares here and he's got this light squared bishop and then my rook protects both this pawn the c pawn and the a5 square and so sometimes even it can be kind of like under time pressure like this, you still got to kind of zoom out, take five, 10 seconds and just kind of look at the big picture because that kind of helped me just kind of come up with an idea. A lot of times in these positions, you need to focus on a second weakness to win, but you also have to like be aware of their counterplay. So I did not want to get a situation where this pawn starts running, was able to run down the board or this king is able to take out this pawn and, and you know, enter the fray. And then things could get really ugly. So I decided I would have to try to make some headway over here and hunt down um, the H pawn. So I wished I had a, a bit more time um, on my clock here because I knew um, this this F five move is you know. I didn't have time to calculate everything out to make sure that it absolutely works. I knew I, I needed to get a second inroads to create, you know, two weaknesses on opposite sides of the board to try to win this game. And it ended up working out, but you know, there's uh this is where I, I for the fir first time I felt like, okay, I got this, you know, almost for sure I should be able to win this on increment. So he let me get in this move, uh, f4 which basically locks that pawn on uh, f3 so it just takes his bishop out of the game so now my task is is much easier because i can just grab this h pawn and then maneuver my my king up in So he put up a lot of resistance until the very end there. He kind of didn't didn't play optimally. And right here he actually resigned because um, now I can just, you know, it's basically impossible for him. I get both these pawns I can just kind of shove up um, and there's nothing he can really do about it. He can't, he can't, uh, he can't control both of them at the same time. So, um, yeah, I was like really happy with this position, with this game because I beat a strong player. Um, and I felt like I did pretty good under time pressure converting this this end game. Even though it was an easily winning position, these um, these stronger players can still throw a lot of sand in your eyes, and you got to just um, not lose focus and really really concentrate. Um, but I also learned the subtlety um, if we look at it that there's a big difference between this position here. And this position here, the location of our C pawn. So it's a big difference when our pawn is on C5 and he can do D take C and, and gain a tempo on our queen. So um, I'm kind of excited about chess. Like um, I think the idea of playing um, 
this was only a 15-10 game, but still putting some time into the analysis. My Dojo Liga opponent last week forfeited, didn't show up, couldn't get a hold of him. And it looks like uh, this week I may have the same thing. Like they don't have a player on the, on the board that I'm on for this week, so they must have had a player quit their team. So unless they get an alternate, I may not be able to play my Dojo Liga match this week again. So, um, But I'm kind of convinced is that for a, like an older adult, the way to improve is to play these fairly simple openings and try to understand them not by memorizing a bunch of, of uh, lines, but by playing and then trying to dissect it and compare the positions you got to stuff you already know about it and try to look for the subtle differences. Like here, um, that kind of really cements my understanding of this positions with the early queen to b6. And I'm going to play that as white. Um, you know, I'm going to, you know, play the, the two knights tabia. So I will be doing something like uh, how I would play this position. Oops. Is in this position here. I would play the the two knights tabia. So then, when they come when they come here, I can just go here and just. Let them grab it. It's called the poison pawn. So I've been trying to work on those lines, and in all of my repertoire, that's probably the most memory intensive thing. But it, you know, I figure it will pay dividends because I was willing to to enter these lines as black um, because I've studied it from the white side, and um, it's kind of like difficult to play for both sides if you haven't put some time into it. So I figured that would be one area where if I could get it on both sides of the board once in a while, it would be worth the time putting in to trying to get a, a better understanding of those positions. So anyway, um, I was excited about that game and I uh, hope you guys got something for it. Sorry, it's a little loud here. We, we have an, a bald eagle nest uh, not too far from our house. And then uh, I kind of live up uh, in Lake country in Wisconsin. And, you know, uh, with uh, 4th of July coming soon, we get all these weekend warriors up here from the Twin Cities that, um, you know, making a bunch of noise. So Sorry for the, the extraneous noise in the background, but I kind of like getting outside on the deck and and um, just going through my games. So take care. Bye.